All right, we've been, it's our theme verse for the whole year, and to really get a good grip on what is this one thing that Paul does, and that every Christian should do, we've been spending time looking at Philippians 3, 13 and 14. But I want you, and I'm going to talk about the reaching fourth part of the scripture. Next week will be the, the, the capstone that will be finished on the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But uh, I want you to get an idea. This book, the, the, the small book called the book to the Philippians, was written by Paul while he's sitting in prison. You kind of have to get an idea of if, if you... If you were in prison for trying to do good, trying to do right, how would you feel? How would you express yourself? Well, instead of moaning and instead of complaining like we would do, he was busy dictating a letter to some of the most precious people in his life, and they were the Christians over in Philippi. And Philippi was, uh, I don't know, 800 miles away across the Aegean Sea. And... He's writing them, trying to encourage them. Now, think about where Paul is. He's basically almost alone. He's in prison in, in, uh, in, Philip, in, sorry, in Rome. And he's worried about people who are nearly a thousand miles away and worried about them staying faithful, staying encouraged. You gotta, you gotta realize only Christ can change a person to where they think of others. And Paul knew how hard it was to stay faithful when things were hard. And he has some ideas on how to keep doing what we're supposed to do. The ideas, they're under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I shouldn't say ideas. He has learned how to stay faithful. And I want to just be honest with you. He found it hard just like you and I do. Somebody says, it's hard to tithe, Pastor. And I say, of course it is. It's hard for all of us. Well, it's hard to be in church every Sunday morning. I know, it's hard for every one of us. There's not one person who finds it easy to live the Christian life. But Paul learned how to stay faithful and stay focused on, uh, on the Christian life. You see, it's not too complicated. He just said, just do one main thing. Do one main thing. And he writes it there. Let's look at Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Why don't you read it out loud with me? I'm not going to have you stand up. Just read out loud with me. It's our memory verse, but it's also our verse for today, let's read it beginning on verse 13 now. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So out of all the things that are listed there, there's one main thing that he does, and that is he pressed towards the mark. Now, our mark is a distant line or a point that marks the end of the Christian race. Most people don't see the finish line. Most people only see from day to day where they're at. But there is a finish line, folks. There is an end, and it is a glorious end. It's a good end. So uh, it's, it's very important for us to keep that, that mark, that, that line in our sight instead of where we're at or even our past. So... Uh, our mark is that distant line or point that marks the end of the race. And there's another scripture in Hebrews that says that we are supposed to run with patience whatever race God has for us, looking unto Jesus, keeping our eyes on Him so that we've passed that, that finish line. Now, there are two efforts that are required before you can do the one main effort. What's the one main effort? To cross the finish line, all right? You're going to cross it, but you want to cross it as a winner, and, uh, but there are two things that he requires in, uh, that Paul tells us are required in Philippians 3 before I can press on, before I can actually finish that line. And the first one is I need to forget the things that are behind. You might remember what the second thing was. I forget. No, well, that's relaxing on all the past, but what's the other thing that I'm supposed to do? Reach forth. I'm supposed to reach forth into those things which were before. That's, it's a simultaneous activity. Now, I, I took karate when, or, or something like it when I was a child. Uh, I could probably have Gavin, or I could have uh, Weston up here, and they could do a great performance. You know how they are. <laughs> but there is something about all of that style that is pictured in this description that Paul says. And it's a fluid motion of you're forgetting 
and you're reaching. It's, a, it's in motion. It's at the same time. You're forgetting whatever is holding you back. You just, you just don't let it. You relax about it, like we said last week. And you are reaching forth, and you're stressing about what God has for you. And that's a good thing. Because when these two things are done together at the same time, Christians, Christians can then say, I can finish. Because your past will tell you, I won't finish. But if you reach toward whatever God has for you and the will of God for your life, you can stay encouraged. And I'll be more about that next week. All right. So far, I've told you, I've showed you that our memories can hinder us from doing the will of God. There are too many Christians that are enslaved to the hurts and the bitterness and the pit of all of those past events of their life. A lot of times the things in our memories stop us from trusting anybody. I'm never going to trust anybody again. Well, that's wrong, okay? You trust God, but the Bible says you need to be able to trust people too. You need to be able to just love them and serve them and, 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 and not worry if they hurt you or not. And uh, uh, forgetting will free you from a lot of chains of your past. That's why he says you got to be a good forgetter, but there's something else to do. So we need to be good forgetters, but there's one other thing that's to do, and that, needs, that is we need to be good reachers. Now, I like going to preachers' conferences. I like to hear great preaching. And um, I'm glad when men strive to be good preachers, but God wants us as Christians to be great reachers more, okay? My big job here is not to preach well. My big job is to reach well for the will of God for my life. And you don't have to perform well, but you do need to strive well. You do need, you do need to say, whatever God has for me, I want, and I want to hold on to all the way to the end. So Paul starts off and he says that we need to reach for something. Well, what does it mean to reach for? Now, I like this. Whenever you do a Bible study, look up your words. Look up what does it mean to reach forth? Because they're very descriptive words. The first thing I want you to understand is it means to reach out your hand as far as possible. When he says reaching forth, it means um, uh, stretch out your body to get closer, whatever is ahead of you, that God says belongs to you. It's like grabbing something. Now, if, if somebody, if there was a hundred euro note dangling on the top of a tree limb, I guarantee you, you pass by it, you're going to figure out a way to reach for it, aren't you? You'd grab ladders and poles and whatever you needed just to get that 100 euro note. If you're walking along and you saw the glimmer of, 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 of a ring, a wedding ring, down in a, a, a hole somewhere, maybe it's a, a, a manhole or a, a, a grate, where um, uh, water goes down underneath, and you saw this glimmer of a ring, you would reach for it, or you'd get a stick and find out how much that thing is going to get you for a reward. Now, to actually to, uh, to, to reach forth means to actually touch something that is beyond our current reach. Um, when Paul, and this, this is a very descriptive phrase, in Acts chapter 26, uh, Paul is standing before Agrippa, and it says these words, he stretched forth his hand. And this is, very, this is very amazing because what's he doing? When he's standing before the king, King Agrippa, and all these people are watching, he's about to give his testimony and about to give his gospel defense of why he does what he does. And he stretches forth the hand. And you say, what's he doing that? He's trying to touch and influence everybody in that room. He's reaching out. He's not just, he's not just standing there and trying to, uh, with anger, repel all of their accusations. He's turned around and he says, I think myself happy today to be able to answer for myself. He's reaching out to all of that audience and trying to give them the gospel. The third thing that it, the meaning of reaching is to grab, to apprehend, to seize or possess what is just ahead of you. You do not need to go back to the past and get something or fix something or do something better. There is something ahead of you you need to get a hold of. One other thought, and that is to, to reach forth means to go another step, and then go another step, and then go another until you apprehend what's ahead of you. Now, it's, it's, um, uh, let me give you some examples. There's also one other point, and that is to never quit. Uh, reaching forth is something you do without quitting. 
Now, an example of it would be a runner. I don't know if you've ever seen runners. As they get closer and closer to that finish line, they seem to lean further and further over. You ever notice that? What are they doing? They are trying to put their body ahead of everybody else to be able to break that line, break through that finish line. That's an example of reaching forth. Another would be the swimmers. You see these swimmers, and they swim, and they reach as far as they can. And if you've ever done swimming, and you close your eyes or whatever, and you're, you're, you're trying to get to the other side, your, your, your hands are what you're using to touch the edge of the swimming pool and to get to that other side. They're reaching, stretching themselves to get to the other side. There's one other thought, and that is yeah, a fruit farmer may be able to reach up and grab a few apples or pears or something from a tree, but you got to realize there's a lot of fruit that is beyond your reach, and you can't just let that fruit rot. The goal of the Christian is to see that God has a lot more for you than what you currently have. He has a lot more to change in you than you currently are. And it's going to take you reaching beyond your current stretch and reaching up so that none of that fruit is missed. And anybody who has a fruit tree and you sell the fruit, you would not leave one piece on the tree. Now, what does it mean to be a good reacher? Well, four or five things. Number one, if you go to Ephesians chapter 2, you're in Philippians, go back to the left. And we're speaking of the fact that it takes effort on our part to be a reacher. When Paul says forgetting some things and reaching forth to some things, he's, ex he's expressing effort. But you better be careful because Ephesians 2 verse 8 says this, that we're not talking about becoming saved. Ephesians 2 8 says, for by grace are you saved through what? Faith. It's not of yourselves. Salvation is the gift of God. Salvation is not of what? All right, so in your mind, it's not of effort. There's nothing I do. I can't go to church. I can't be baptized. I can't uh, recite a long prayer. Anything that I might try to do to try to prove to God that I'm worthy is a work, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're not dealing with effort to get saved. We're dealing now with what it means a person is, is saved. Because the Christian life is a lot of effort, whether you realize it or not. It's not something you do. Christianity is not something you do with a TV remote. Now, I, 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 I make myself spiritual. Uh, now I make myself, um, uh, you know, a, I'm going to give online. I'm going to, everything's not done online these days. It really is weird. We're so used to pushing buttons, speaking into our phone, and that's pretty cool. I mean, you can actually say, what temperature, temperature is it outside? You ever, you ever done that? And, and it's pretty cool. But there is a danger where we think that everything is like that. We order things online. But reaching is not something that anyone can do without effort. And nobody can do it for you. You've got to get up and reach for things yourself. I try to prepare, and I try to let God teach me something so I can teach you something. But this is not you and your growth. I, can't, I, I can feed you, but you're going to have to learn to feed yourself. If you wait till Sunday before you open your Bible, you're starving. And you're like a raisin. You're shrinking. You're not growing. So the Christian life is you getting up and reaching for things yourself. And it's, stress, it's stressful because, because nobody else may be going the same direction you're going. Other people may be just lounging around and lazy, and you're the only one that's striving to be more like Christ. Did you know that um, getting out of your house and, uh, uh, and exercising and sweating is a good thing? I think a lot of us are afraid of, of perspiration, but... It's, it's one of the healthiest things you can do. As a matter of fact, God said when he kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, he said, Adam, you're going to have to sweat. By the perspiration of your brow, you're going to have to raise food. You're going to have to process it. You're going to have to bake it. Everything you do is going to be hard. You know why he did that? Because our health is designed now to need to work and work hard. And when you don't work hard, your health goes down. It really does. 
to go out soul winning with us on Saturday. It takes time. It takes effort. Grabbing your Bible instead of your iPad takes effort. Let me ask you this. Why do we believe that only farmers have to sweat to do what they do? And I believe they work hard. Why do we let doctors and engineers study harder than we do as Christians? Why do we expect that gospel ministry should be is easier than any other profession? I know there are many of you who think that my, I must have nothing to do during the week. And that I just sort of float along and then I reach up to heaven and grab a message and I set it down and I write a few things down on a piece of paper. You heard about the three kids were talking about their dads. And one, side, one guy says, my dad is uh, so powerful he can write a note and he can fire somebody right away just with a strike of his pen. Another kid says, oh, you know, that's nothing. My dad can get a piece of paper and he can sign a check and all of a sudden money comes out of the bank and I've just seen it. It's my dad's got the power of that pen. And the third kid says, you don't know anything. My dad can get up and he can write down a few scribbles on a piece of paper and speak and they take up offerings all morning long. And people think that, you know, you've got such an easy job and, 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 you know, you write down a few things. But if anybody's ever seen my notes, there are pages of things that I've studied and I've tried to learn so I can teach you because it takes work. The gospel ministry is one of the hardest works you'll ever do because you're carrying a burden of, of countless numbers of people you're praying for, you're ministering to, you're trying to feed a lot of different people. You're doing it because God called you to do it. Go to 1 Corinthians. Go back to the left. Find 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in verse 10. First Corinthians 15, 10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. It wasn't wasted. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Paul says, I work harder than anybody else. And if I read my Bible right, and if I know Bible history well and church history, I, I found out that the world was turned upside down, not by theologians, but by practical Christians who, uh, who gave their blood, sweat, and tears that people would get saved and that churches would get started. So it takes effort. And by the way, it's not something you do when you're motivated. Well, I'll go to church if I feel like it. Well, if I read my Bible, uh, I'll, I'll read my Bible when I feel like it. When Paul says to reach forth, he is describing a determination in your mind to say, it's what I need to do. It's something that I keep doing. I have found that we got a lot of good starters in, in, in our Christianity. But we don't have a lot of good finishers. You need to, if you started reading your Bible, Gavin's not here this morning. Now, Gavin has read through his Bible uh, and finished uh, at the end of last year. Praise God. But I would tell him, like I tell you, uh, keep reading. It's no good to start and not finish. Keep reading your Bible. Keep stretching beyond yourself. Keep doing the things even though you're tired. You say, well, I'm tired on a Sunday night. So am I. And you say, there are things I need to keep reaching for. I don't know if you realize this, but the reason why we have church is so that you, you learn and you grow and you, 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 um, you become more and more like Christ. And it takes a lot of effort, folks. It takes a lot of effort to put out the time to learn what it is to be a Christian, to be Christ-like. Um, I was saved 39 years ago. And, and, and because a woman didn't give up on handing out gospel tracts, at a, at, a, at a coffee shop, she pulled out a gospel tract and handed to three young teenagers a gospel tract and invited us out to church, gave us a gospel, very straightforward with us that we needed to get saved. And I'm just glad that she didn't quit the day before and say, I'm giving up, nobody's listening. I'm glad that she didn't quit giving out the gospel. Amen. Because what if she had? I've only been given the gospel personally by somebody twice in my life. I'm 56 years old. And I've only been, somebody's only walked up to me twice and given me a gospel track in all that time. Where would I be if that woman had quit and said, nobody's listening? Go to Romans 15. Go back to the left a little bit further. Romans chapter 15 and verse 20. You say, why is a Christian life so hard? I don't know. Other than the fact that the devil makes it hard. 
The flesh makes it hard. The world it looks like everything is against us, but that's okay. Uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 20. Mark this verse. Mark, uh, sorry, uh, Romans 15, 20. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel. Not where Christ was named. Did you know it's pretty easy to preach to all of you? You know why? Because you all pretty well like me, amen? And so I'm not, there aren't any tomatoes in anybody's hands. And I don't have to worry about whether I can escape through a back door. No, Paul says, I have striven, I've strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. They that have not heard shall understand. Paul says, I have striven to go where it was hard to preach. I've, I've gone to where people don't know and where it is very dangerous. We need a generation today that determines not to draw our hands back and to quit, but to go even though it's hard. Go to Joshua chapter 8. I'll give you some illustrations of reaching forth. Joshua chapter 8. <clears throat> Joshua 8 and verse 26. We need a generation, and I have to, I stand, I, I stand in awe at some new political parties here in Ireland. Now, they don't dot all the I's like I wish, but let me tell you this. They have decided that they're going to take on the political establishment of Fine Gael and Fine Fall, and they're going to try and get this country back moral and going to try to protect the life of the unborn. And they are going against incredible odds with almost no money. And I go, amen. Amen. Because that's what it's going to take. You don't just wait until everybody. No, you have to determine this is right to do. Look at Joshua chapter 8 and verse 26. Very descriptive phrase for Joshua. Watch these words. Drew not his hand back, wherewith he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. If you know the background, they were supposed to go against this little bitty town. They had become way overconfident with Jericho. They came to this little bitty town, and Joshua says, ah, oh, it won't take much time. Just a few of you go and defeat that, that city. They were supposed to uh, uh, destroy all the cities of the of Canaan land, of the Promised Land, and, and build their cities there. And um, when, when Ai defeated uh, Israel, Joshua said, Lord, what did we do wrong? And there was a whole long story. There was a guy named Achan who, was, who had sinned and, and, and God had backed away. He said, I'm not going to help you anymore. But when it came time to go, to go to battle, Joshua, instead of sending a few people to go down with it, Joshua himself went head first. He went into the battle and it says he didn't stop. He drew not his hand back, wherewith he stretched out the spear, until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. He was determined not to stop until the job was done. Go to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 23. Second Samuel chapter 23 and verse 9. I like this guy. These are some, some mighty men of David. And in verse 9, it describes one of the men who got in got surrounded by the Philistines, and listen to how he fought. It says this in 2 Samuel 23, verse 9, and after him, after this guy, the first guy's name uh, is Adino, and uh, verse 9, after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo the Ahoite, one of the three mighty men with David. When they defied, when they mocked, when they took on the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel, where were they? They were gone. Maybe they went to McDonald's. I don't know. But they were away. And this guy, Eliezer, is the only one there. In verse 10, he arose. When the Philistines came up and attacked, he arose and he smote the Philistines. Watch this. Until his hand was weary. But he couldn't quit. Why? It says his hand clave, clung unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. Everybody got up there and they says, well, what happened here? And he says, and he's got this sword in his hand. He can't pry his fingers back. He couldn't stop because it had become part of him. And so he just started swinging the sword whenever somebody would come against him. 
And some people say, you know, well, the Old Testament. The Old Testament shows you spiritual warfare in its reality. In, in the Old Testament, it was real. In the New Testament, it's spiritual. But let me tell you, when, when this book becomes so part of our life that we, we can't even put it down, we can't even quit because it is stuck there, that's a good time. That's a good way to live. It is where we don't quit. Now, I guarantee you that man probably tried to quit. His hand was tired. He was worn out. If you know anything about those kind of hand-to-hand combats, people would come. There was, there, was, there was no distance. There was no guns and missiles and airplanes. It was one-on-one. It was hard. And he got tired, but he couldn't quit. And God brought a great victory. So even though you're tired, even though you want to quit, if you stay at it, God gives the victory in your home, in your marriage, in your Christian walk. Now, Jesus showed us this very powerfully. Go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. In verse 38. Mark 1, 38. Jesus, he said unto them, let us go where? Back home. Let's go see what's on TV tonight. Let's go chillax and just chill out. No, it says, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. I came to work. Here's the best one. Go back a few pages to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26 and verse 36. This is a, a priceless portion of Scripture here where Jesus is in Gethsemane. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them, with his disciples, unto a place called Gethsemane. And he saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and very Heavy, that's an attitude, that's an emotion. He's dealing at that point with overwhelming waves of heaviness. Verse 38, Then saith he unto them, he's saying unto Peter, James, and John, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto what? He feels like he's going to die. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Keep aware. Pray with me. And he went a little further, and he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now, here's, here's the crazy thing. Did you notice that phrase in there? And he went a little... All right, where were his disciples? Well, not yet. The other, the other nine are over there sleeping, okay? But Peter, James, and John, they're at least with Jesus. But when he goes that little step further, not one of them goes with him. And as he, start, he starts to pray and he starts to cry out to God for, for uh, strength to get through that night, he comes back to them and how, what are they doing at that point? They're sleeping. Now go back, go to verse 42. Verse 42, he went, a, he went away again the second time and prayed saying, Oh, my father, this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it. Thy will be done. And he came and he found them asleep again. So he's already woken them up for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and watch this and went away again and prayed the third time. What do you see Jesus doing? Reaching forward. Even though nobody's going with him, even though they're all sleeping, even though they're all comfortable and they don't care what he's going through, he keeps going. Now that's our Savior. Well, say that's Jesus. Yeah, but he's our example. He's our example. Now, there'll be a day where I have to slow down. I'm 56 years old, right? and I can't flip my age. If I flip my age, I'm doomed. I'd be 65. Some of us can't flip our ages and become dyslexic. If I'm 56 years old or 57. I can't even remember now at this point. I just know I'm not 61. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> but let me tell you this. There will come a day where I will have to slow down. But it's not today. And I want to make sure I stay healthy so I don't have to slow down. I'm going to make sure I eat right so I don't have to slow down too soon. I don't want to end up in the hospital. I don't want to end up too sickly that I can't keep soul winning, that I can't keep preaching. Do you understand? I want to keep reaching forth, and I hope you do too, because it takes effort. Secondly, it takes good eyesight. 
Uh, I love, now, Colum's not here, but I love watching Colum. We were at Awesome Walls on Saturday with, or was it Friday? It was Friday. We were at Awesome Walls with uh, Colum and kids, uh, and the grandkids, and little Colum there, um, uh, is, this is how he is. love that. And I said, that's what I want to be. I want to see what God has for me. I want to be able to point at it and go for it. And he's just seen all the colors on the walls, and he just sees all of those foot pieces and hand pieces and everything, and he's just enamored by everything. I'm sure he's like that at home as well in many ways. But what good would it be if you just closed your eyes and you stood there? You would miss if you've ever been to Awesome Walls, if you've ever done any wall climbing, you would miss the great thrill and the great um, um, just joy of climbing up those walls and accomplishing something there. And you miss it if you don't have good eyesight. I think we have the best reasons to reach forth, to point at something and go for it. Go to Ruth. The, uh, go to the, the little book of Ruth after Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then comes Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Find Ruth. Chapter 2, this is such a, a special uh, concept here. Jo um, you're going to see a word where it says, where it's going to use, you're going to see a phrase where it uses the word reach. And I want you to understand what's happening because Boaz is in love with Ruth, and he, she doesn't know it yet, um, and he wants his kindness to reach to her, and so he's going to pass a huge tray or maybe a bag of fresh bread with enough supply for everyone, making sure that it reaches all the way to her. Now watch this. Look at Ruth chapter 2 in verse 14, and Boaz said unto her, to Ruth, at mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and drink thy morsel in the, in the vinegar. And she sat, not next to him, but she sat down beside all the other reapers, all the other workers. And he, Boaz, he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and she was suffice and left. So if you imagine, what normally would happen is, somebody would be grabbing up and just setting whatever amount of bread on a tray and sending it down the line, and they would take their bread and pass it on. And if it ended up being empty by the time it got to somebody, you'd just sort of say, we didn't get enough bread down here. But you got to understand Boaz. Boaz saying he's piling on the bread to make sure it gets all the way to her. He's reaching someone that was unreachable. There was no way she would ever think that Boaz could love her. And he's trying to show, I want you to come, and I want you to eat at my table. And then all of a sudden she gets this, at the end, when that, when that big tray or that basket of bread gets to her, it's got loads in there. And I can just see, and if you read this story, it's a great love story, I can just see her looking down and going, hmm, and realizing, that was very kind of you. It takes good eyesight. What is he trying to do? He's pointing, he's saying, at a, a goal, and he reaches for it, and he reaches for it, and he gets the girl. That's the great story of the lesson there. Effort. It takes good eyesight, like I said. It takes a passionate attitude. When you're reaching for someone, you ever watched a dog leap for a frisbee in midair? It's breathtaking. You know what that dog's doing? He's not taking a leap of faith. He's not blind. That dog, any dog that learns how to catch a frisbee, has its, its eye on that frisbee, and it's just breathtaking. They catch it in their mouth, and they bring it to you. Well, I wish we had the same passion for whatever God throws at us because God puts out in front of us His will and we run from it. How would you like to have a dog? Come on, Rex. Come on, Rex. Oh, good, good, good boy. You go catch this and he runs away. <laughs> Bad boy, get over here. <laughs> and you pick up a stick and says, go fetch the stick and he runs the other way. That's not, and yet that's Christians. Have a passionate attitude. Oh, that we had a passion for what God puts in front of us. God gave you a Bible to read. God wants you to have a passion in, in reading it and knowing it yourself. You do realize 
every one of us will have to stand before God and give an account of ourselves. I will have to stand there with you, but don't you think for a minute that you can blame me for your lack of spiritual growth. You're going to answer to God how much time you spent in the Bible. You're going to answer to God how little time you spent ever praying for souls to be saved and for people who God put on your heart. You're going to answer to God for how you lived your life. You need to have a passionate attitude. I wish we had a passionate attitude like if, like if this was, a, uh, was a, uh, a match or something. And I've seen some. I don't care how cold it is. They're all sitting outside, and they don't mind being there at the match. Amen? Oh, I can't go to church today. Look at all the frost on the cars. What time is the match? Okay, I'll be there in 20 minutes. <laughs> don't do that. Have a passionate attitude to apprehend the will of God, whatever it may be. Another thing, you need empty hands. And this may be a reason why a lot of Christians quit the Christian race. They quit trying to accomplish the will of God in their lives. Why? Because they've already got something in their hand. They've got something they're satisfied with, something they won't let go of. It may be the past, but it may be a nice, cushy, comfortable career where you may be doing just fine and you hear the plea go out. As often as I can remind you, there are multitudes and multitudes and multitudes who have never heard the name Jesus. And somebody's got to go and take them the gospel. And you can't just wait for somebody else to do it when God's calling you. And you say, wait a minute, I've got a career. Now what you mean is, I'm not going to reach for that because my hands are full already. Maybe you've got a nice home. Some hands are full of bitterness, painful memories, disappointments. Well, you know, I tried to do something and it, it didn't work. That's the past. Forgetting those things which are behind. I find that a lot of Christians and even pastors and missionaries are shipwrecked because their hands were full of anger against the ministry. And they've been hurt and they won't say, I've got to keep reaching forth. No wonder Paul says for us to forget those things. Because you have to empty your hands. Maybe you have to empty your life if you're going to reach for something better. What does God show us that we need to reach for? Now, there'll be more on this next week. But i got to remind you, Paul has pretty well left everything. Paul left behind him the religious ceremonies, the duties, and the expectations of all his good works. He put it behind him. He says there's none of that was any good. He put aside all the personal prejudices and bigotries against everyone that was not like him. Here was this top-notch um, spit spot, dotting eyes, crossing T Jew. And he was going out to the Gentiles, to the pagans, to the heathen. And he, who used to believe everyone that was not a Jew was a dog, now saw them as souls and was willing to give his life for them. He put all that behind him. He probably had a lot of wealth and power and prestige among all the Jewish elite. Well, he left all of that life. What was he reaching for? What was God offering him in its place? Well, I got some ideas. One of them I want to make sure you understand is the will of God. You know, the will of God is there to change you. Some people say, God, I'll do anything you want except be a missionary. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I'll marry anyone except a brunette. Um, the will of God is meant to change you. The will of God will always re re result in somebody getting saved, churches started, people growing. But the will of God is meant to change you. I have watched over the last 10 years, have you noticed it? Our world has gone bat crazy because 16-year-olds are passionate about saving the world. Have you noticed that? Everyone is so bent on changing the world and saving the world, but they're not one second interested in themselves changing. They don't think they need to be saved. They don't feel like they need to humble themselves and serve the Lord Jesus. No, they want to make sure you're different. The will of God is meant to change you. Whether it changes anybody else, it ought to change you. Secondly, the great promises of God. You know what Paul believed? The promises of God. He probably, of all the scriptures he quotes, half of them are him claiming a promise. 
claiming a promise. And those promises that God gave us in every scripture, and all Paul had was Matthew, Mark, and Luke, didn't even have the Gospel of John. All Paul had was uh, uh, some of the Gospels and the entire Old Testament, and it's filled with promises. Paul was constantly reminded that Jesus was with him. He was constantly reminded that his own strength, even though it was weak and it was infirm, it was enough because Christ's strength was all he needed. You know, he reached for and what he grabbed, the great promises of God. You need to put them on the wall in your house. You need to find a promise. Every time you're reading through the Bible, mark it, put it on a card, put it on a sheet, um, uh, draw it out or print it out and put it on your wall and remind yourself, God is good. God is there. God, God is my help in time of trouble. Grab those, apprehend those promises of God. How about every reward? Every Christian ought to be reaching for the reward that Christ offers. Go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The will of God changes us. The promises of God carry us on and encourage us. And the rewards call us forward, call us to the end. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may, what's the word? That's it. You want to get the prize. And every man that striveth for the mastery, striving to win, is temperate in all things. Now they, people in the Olympics, do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But why do we do it? To obtain an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into this objection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others about all this, I myself should be a castaway. I don't want to be a wasted life. I want every reward that Christ offers. You know, there is a crown of life. There is a crown of rejoicing. There's a crown of glory. Lay up for yourselves treasures in. What happens when you put them all in the bank? The bank fails. Amen? 2007, 2008. Lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt. I got a question you need to ponder. Will you and I have any reward when we get to heaven? I'm not saying are you going to go to heaven. You go to heaven by the grace of God and by just trust in the Lord Jesus Christ's finished work. But when you get there, is there going to be anything there to show that you loved Christ and you lived for Him? But there may also be times of suffering and sorrow. You know what Paul says? Go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. In verse 22. Acts 20, 22, Paul says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit. I'm captivated by this call unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. I have no idea what's going to happen there, except this, verse 23. Say that the Holy Ghost witnesses everywhere I go in every city, saying that bonds and affliction. What's a bond? Chains, ropes, prison, bonds and afflictions. Abide me, stick to me, <laughs> but none of these things move me. They won't deter me. Neither count I my life dear, dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Hmm. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 24. Paul is here recording his CV. He's describing his life work and his accomplishments. And he says this, Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes from being whipped. Save one. That one time they gave me grace. I didn't get all forty. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. That wasn't with cannabis or anything. He was literally physically stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep, in the water. 
in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, couldn't sleep because he had to watch out for somebody trying to kill him, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside all those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, I carry the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? Did Paul ever get upset? Did Paul ever show his emotions? Did Paul ever respond like a human? Yes, he says there were times where I just burned angry. If I must needs glory, however, I will glory in the things which concern my, not my successes, but my what? My sorrows, my suffering, my weaknesses. Each and every one of those things you and I would have run from, and Paul should have run from if he was normal. But Paul reached for them. He grabbed them. He embraced them. He made them his life. And he proudly lists them as, this is the Christian life. So whatever God lays out before you, this is the point. What do I need to forget? Good or bad, whatever's in your past, forget about it. It's in the past. You don't live there. That's not who you are. I reach, I, I, I reach forth on the things that are before. What is, what is ahead of me? I got news for you. The devil's going to get you off course. He's going to try to lure you away. That's not even in the equation. I'm trying to reach for whatever God has for me. And it's usually hard. Go to Philippians chapter 1. It's usually hard hard. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, this is a gift from Him, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Go to Acts chapter 9. Acts 9. And they say, this isn't a very encouraging message, Pastor. Oh, it's very encouraging. Because the reality of the Christian life is, if I ever do try to do the will of God, it may be the hardest thing I ever do. But it'll be worth it. Next week we'll learn what the prizes are. Acts chapter 9, verse 4. Look at what happens when Paul gets saved. Acts 9, 4. And he fell to the earth and he heard a voice, this is Saul of Tarsus, saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why are you fighting me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, Yep. The Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And he, Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I'm ready to do a great thing for you now. Oh, really? And the Lord said unto him, I ain't telling you. He doesn't tell him. He says, Arise, I want you to go into the city, into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now go down to verse 13. So you got a guy named Ananias who's getting ready to baptize him. He doesn't know Saul's saved. He doesn't know anything. And listen to what Jesus says to Ananias. And he hath seen, this is verse 12. Go to verse uh, uh, 11. And the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire at the, ho hand, at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. This is Jesus is talking to Ananias. Go to that street called Straight, look for Saul, for behold, he prayeth, verse 12, and Saul hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias with your name coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, uh, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. He's a threat to me. He could hurt me. He could imprison me. Verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Sounds so good so far. Verse 16, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, he didn't tell Paul right away how much suffering he was going to go through. And I'm glad he didn't tell us all the things and all the bad things we may have to go through. But it's of the will of God, we embrace them. Bit by bit, whatever God gives us, 
It comes from a loving God who knows where we need to be and knows how to change us. Now somebody says, uh, so, so whatever God has for you, grab it, seize it, hold on to it as a gift from God. That's how come a Christian has joy. We don't go by our experiences. We go by the fact that our God is good and he's faithful and he doesn't change. But there's plenty of obstacles. But so what? We need a generation of Christians who are well aware of the hardships that are ahead for anyone who follows Christ. The losses we will endure, the persecutions we will face, the defeats, the defeats and failures we will weep over, the costs we will pay, all simply because we're doing God's will. Hebrews chapter 11, all because we're doing God's will. Hebrews 11, and verse 13. <clears throat> Hebrews eleven thirteen says, These all died in faith, not having received all the promises yet, but having seen them how? Way off, afar off, and were persuaded of them. What did they do? They embraced them. They apprehended them. And they confessed that here, they're just strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Whatever obstacle is in your way, I don't care if you trip the entire way. Weston, this is very encouraging to me because as I try to do the will of God, I do nothing but knock things over, I trip, I mess up. But the goal is not so that I'm perfect, the goal is to finish. That's the goal of the Christian. Whatever obstacles you've ever experienced, that end is what I'm trying to embrace. So why was Paul so successful in his Christian life? Why is any Christian successful? I believe it's because he was a good forgetter. He forgot about all the people who hurt him, didn't worry about people who said things against him. He just ignored it. He worried more about what he was doing to others. And he was, became a great reacher. And if you'll do both, you can finish the race. What have you reached for lately? Have you even prayed and said, Lord, what is your will for my life? Have you got me in some place that I just want to run from? And if it's your will for me to stay right here, if it's your will for me to be a witness right here in this hard situation, so be it. I apprehend it. I, I embrace it. Uh, what have you reached for? Have you spent any time marking down the promises? And the, uh, too many Christians have, have only the TV to encourage them. That's all they have. They have their friends. When you have the scriptures and you have the promises of God, embrace them. Say, Lord, you know, I haven't done much for you, and I don't, I don't want to waste my life. I don't want to be living in vain. I'd like my life to count for something. Would you help me to live so that you can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'd like to have some reward at the end of my life to give back to you and to honor you. And no matter how hard it may be, why don't you ask God to show you how great things you might have to suffer? for Christ's namesake, and then reach for every one of them. You see, this is not a popular message. This is the hardest of all of these concepts. Forgetting's hard. But reaching forth to the will of God will be harder because the will of God is not, I'm aimed to make your life better, like Joel Osteen says. Do not believe the prosperity gospel of everything is going to come your way. No, it's not. Whatever God asks you to do, reach for it. I'm going to ask you this. What good would it be to have striven so hard and so long to do things right if you do not have Christ yourself? I'm talking to you about living for Christ and maybe you don't even have Christ. It's an awful thing for you to try to make your life moral and try to read your Bible, try to be at church, but your heart is empty. There's never been a day where Jesus Christ washed you and cleansed you and made you his child. I'm telling you, that's the beginning of life. That is where your life begins, and it has to begin where you humble yourself and realizing you're never going to live up to heaven. The only good you'll ever do is enough to send you to hell. So why don't you trust Jesus Christ who did it all? Cry to him and ask him to save you. And if he did save you, say, Lord, 
My life belongs to you. I want to make sure that I strive to accomplish whatever you want me to do. Whatever God designed you to be and to do, do it with all your heart. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, if I was speaking to a sports team, or if I was speaking to a group of runners, I would tell them, press on. I would tell them, keep that finish line in focus. Don't let anything distract you. Don't let anyone else in the race take your attention off of that finish line. And they would listen. And they would, they would take it on board that they've got to stay focused on finishing that race. If I were talking to anybody getting into a boxing ring, I'd say, keep your focus on, on, on staying away from such and such a swing and, and, and keep your focus on staying standing longer than the other guy. And the boxer would understand that. But I'm speaking to Christians who very rarely get into the Christian race and very rarely get into the spiritual fight that we're in. And so, Lord, I pray something affects every Christian here this morning, affects them and get them to realize we're in something that's serious and I haven't taken it serious. I've let my life just go with the flow. I just do what everybody else is doing. And it's time for me to set my course and to be like Jesus Christ and to press on and go a little further and a little further and reach for the will of God. From this small church, Men and women can do great things as they do the will of God. If we wait for anyone else to do it beside, it'll never, nothing will get done. Everyone in this room needs to say, Lord, there's some things I've been, you've told me to forget. Show me the things I need to reach for now. Lord, somebody in this room struggling with their own self-righteousness, May they humble themselves and cry out to you right now and ask, their, ask you to save their soul. Because that's the whole reason why the gospel is out there. So that we can know Jesus. And we can have a different life. Yeah, I think it's better. But it may just be harder. But it would be worth it. So God, in this, in this quiet time, I pray that we would decide, I'm going to reach forth. I'm not going to keep the way I am. I'm not going to stay the way I am. I'm getting going. I'm going forward. I'm going to find out what you called me to do and what you made me to be. In Jesus' name.